At the bottom of the north face of the Little Bighorn Battlefield Monument, there is one name, Isaiah. If you can prove you're related to him, the army owes you $102.50. Isaiah is Isaiah Dorman, one of the 7th Cavalry's interpreters and the only black man present at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Isaiah Dorman is an enigma. There are no known photographs of him, but his story defies modern conventional wisdom of the American West. It reminds us that people back then were every bit as complicated and three-dimensional as people are today. Historians think Isaiah was born free in Pennsylvania sometime around 1832 to a Jamaican father and a mixed black and Delaware Indian mother. By the 1850s, he had made his way out west, where he became friendly with the Indians living in the Dakotas. They described him as being very big and very black. They called him Azimpi, which means nipple in Lakota, maybe a way of trying to pronounce Isaiah's name. Isaiah learned the local language and customs and was known as a Wichasa Sapa, a black white man. He no doubt had friends among the natives and apparently was on good terms with a man named Sitting Bull, who at this time was rapidly making a name for himself as a leader among his tribe. Isaiah married a Santee Sioux woman named Celeste St. Pierre and started a family. He earned money chopping wood for nearby Fort Ridgely in southern Minnesota territory. Isaiah next found work as a servant for General Alfred Sully, who was sent back east when the Civil War began in 1861. In May 1863, General Sully was relieved of command and went back to the Dakotas. Isaiah followed him, glad to be going back to the area he considered home. After the war, Isaiah and Celeste settled near Fort Rice, south of Bismarck. Isaiah chopped wood for a local company, then accepted a job to deliver mail for the army twice a month. The route was from Fort Rice to Fort Wadsworth, about 360 miles round trip and plagued with danger. When word got out that Isaiah was fluent in Lakota, his career began to take off. He was hired by the Fort Rice commander as the post's interpreter and translator. The officers quickly learned to respect and appreciate Dorman's talents. Isaiah was smart, dependable, and well-liked. He was fluent in both English and Lakota, could read and write, and he knew many of the main players in the area. While drunkenness was a problem for many on the plains, Isaiah didn't touch alcohol. In May 1876, Colonel George Custer contracted Isaiah's services for the upcoming campaign against the Sioux. Isaiah's rate was bumped up to $75 a month at a time when army privates were only making 13. On June 25th at the Little Bighorn, most of the scouts and civilians rode with Major Marcus Reno's battalion as they attacked the southern end of the Indian village. Companies M, A, and G formed a skirmish line across the valley and the civilians waited behind the line's left flank. As warriors worked their way around the left, Major Reno ordered a retreat into nearby trees. Here, the soldiers defended the timber from a rapidly growing number of warriors. As Major Reno asked Bloody Knife, one of the Indian scouts, what the Indians would do next, Bloody Knife took a bullet to the back of his head, splattering brains all over the Major. Reno was so shocked that he pulled his revolver and ordered the troopers around him to follow him out of the woods. This order did not get passed to everyone, and there was massive confusion among everyone in the timber. Some of the scouts stayed in the woods, knowing that the Indian warriors would be hesitant to try and flush them out. Others went with the soldiers, among them Isaiah Dorman. George Herondine and lonesome Charlie Reynolds, two civilian scouts, debated whether to leave the timber. Herondine would later say, I saw Reynolds come out of the timber and said, Charlie, don't try to ride out. We can't get away from this timber. Reynolds was trying to mount his horse. He finally mounted and got about 150 yards when he was shot, and Isaiah fell near him. Roman Rutten, a private with Company M, later told how he saw Isaiah making a stand on one knee firing his sporting rifle. Rutten said, Isaiah and I were intimate acquaintances, and as I passed him, he looked up at me and cried out, Goodbye, Rutten. From behind his horse, Isaiah kept firing until he was shot in the chest. Herondine watched what happened next from the tree line. A group of Indians approached Isaiah. Among them was Sitting Bull, who recognized his old friend. For old time's sake, the chief gave Isaiah a drink of water from a buffalo horn cup, then rode on. A young woman variously named Moving Robe Woman, Eagle Robe, or Mary Crawler, then scolded Isaiah. If you did not want to be killed, why did you not stay home where you belong and not come to attack us? She then executed Isaiah with a gunshot. Herondine later said, I saw Indians shooting at Isaiah and squaws pounding him with stone hammers. His legs below the knees were shot full of bullets only an inch or two apart. After the battle, soldiers found Isaiah's mutilated body with a picket pin jammed through his testicles. 
He was buried on the spot until a few years later when his bones were reburied with the rest of the command up on Last Stand Hill. Today, markers dot the area where he died, only yards away from Charlie Reynolds and First Lieutenant Donald McIntosh of Company G. The regimental quartermaster recorded that Isaiah was owed $102.50 for services rendered during May and June of 1876. However, Isaiah's widow could not be located, and nobody with a provable connection to Isaiah claimed the money. So technically, the army still owes Isaiah Dorman's next of kin $102.50. Isaiah wasn't the only person lost in the valley fight. Check out this video to learn about an American unknown soldier found yards away from Isaiah's marker. If you got something out of this video, please like this video, click subscribe, and leave a comment to be part of the conversation. See you on the next one.